Hi everybody, this is Alex from Curvesetter MCAT Prep. I'm here with another MCAT cars video on breaking down um, MCAT passages and then uh, kind of showing you how I approach them on the fly. Um, I haven't read this passage in probably a long time and I haven't prepared answers to that all. So I'm gonna be going through it just the same exact way that you would. And you know, maybe I'll get some questions wrong, but I just wanna show you kind of what my approach is um, with a blank slate. So let's get right into it. This is from one of the old AMC exams. And um, just a few notes before I get started on actually reading. What I like to do is um, from the get-go, I wanna find what the main idea is. Um, this is the author's argument and typically you'll see a movement and change in the author's argument from the beginning to the end. So um, oftentimes passages will start off by making a statement or a claim. And this may seem like what the author's uh, thesis or main idea is, but you'll see it change as you go from paragraph to paragraph. So at the very end, I'm gonna do something that I recommend you guys do when you first start off, especially if, if you're struggling with the car section, and that is summarize each paragraph, what's the point of that paragraph, and then watch that summary as it moves from paragraph to paragraph until the very end. And so you can tie it all together at the end and say, this is what the author wants to leave me with, and you're gonna hold that in your head as you're answering questions. Um, because you can answer most, like, I'd say probably 70 to 80% of questions just based off of the main idea. Um, and it will really help you choose between two. A lot of people get stuck um, choosing between two uh, answer choices and oftentimes um, relying on what the main idea is will help you make that tiebreaker. So let's get into it. We must first make a distinction between literature and literary study. Okay. So what the author is doing is he's starting off by making um, two separate uh, distinctions. One is literature, which assumingly is you know uh, the material that you read, and one is the study of that or literary study. So it's kind of like an analysis of the literature. The two are distinct activities. One is creative, an art. The other, if not precisely a science, is a species of knowledge or of learning, okay? So um, the author's kind of elaborating. So oftentimes if you see like a vague initial statement, there will be an elaboration or explanation of that um, moving forward. And I want you to kind of always be processing what's going on, make predictions, um, make arguments with, with the author, because this, this is gonna keep you engaged in the passage, um, which is another reason why students often struggle with the car section is they find themselves getting bored and then they miss important details. Um, and so it's really important to keep yourself engaged. And one of the things that you can do to ensure that is to um, add your own commentary. Whether it's right or wrong, it doesn't really matter. I think the, the main um, goal should be to keep yourself engaged, especially when the passage seems very boring. So, and oftentimes your analysis is pretty obvious, right? So in this case, the author is saying that um, there's a distinction between literature and literary, literary study. Um, one's creative and the other one is more of a science. And that makes sense, right? Because we said literature is what we read. You know, it's the books that you read in high school and in undergrad. Um, and of course, that takes creativity and it's an art. And the other one is an analysis or a study of that. And that is more scientific um, and is more aimed at learning rather than enjoying an art form. There have been attempts, of course, to obliterate this distinction. For instance, it has been argued that one cannot understand literature unless one writes it. That one cannot and should not study Pope without trying one's own hand at heroic couplets or an Elizabethan drama without writing a drama in a blank verse. Okay, so now we can kind of see where the author is beginning to go. Um, he starts off by saying there's a distinction between two types of study or two types of um, literary realms. One is literature, one is a study of that. 
Um, and um, people have tried to make the distinction go away. Um, so there have been people who have attempted to say that you really can't engage in one without the other. And so if you are studying literature, you must write literature as well. And my gut feeling is that the author is not going to agree with this and he's going to make arguments that go against this. Um, and to say that they, sh they shouldn't, they should remain distinct or that you don't have to engage, you know, in writing in order to appreciate writing, but we'll see what happens. Yet useful as the experience of literary creation is, the task of the student is completely distinct. So this is talking now about literary study. And he's saying, you know, it's useful to be able to create literature, but the student has a different task. The student must translate the experience of literature into intellectual terms, assimilate it to a coherent scheme, which must be rational if it is to be knowledge. It may be true that the subject matter is irrational, or at least contains strongly unrational elements, but the student of literature will not be therefore in any other position than the historian of painting, or the musicologist, or for that matter the sociologist or the anatomist. Okay, so it seems like what the author is saying is that the student really need not be engaging in literature and creating literature in order to study it. It's saying that they have a different role. And what they are supposed to do is they're supposed to experience the literature, right? So read a book and then be able to communicate about it intellect in intellectual terms, um, be able to put it together in a way that's rational. And um, even if the subject matter itself is irrational. Okay, next paragraph. The problem is one of how intellectually to deal with art and with literary art specifically. So the question is, how do we do this, right? The problem is of one. The problem is one of how intellectually to deal with art and with literary art specifically. Can it be done? And how can it be done? One answer has been, it can be done with the methods developed by the natural sciences, which need only to be transferred to the literary, to the study of literature. So one way that the author proposes, or the author proposes, other have proposed um, in, to study literature, like how do we intellectually deal with art? How do we do from the first paragraph literary study? And that is by applying the scientific method, which we apply, um, of course, to drug discovery and biology and things like that. Several kinds of such transfer can be distinguished. One is the attempt to emulate the general scientific ideals of objectivity and personality and certainty, an attempt which on the whole supports the collecting of neutral facts. Okay, so one way of being able to study literature being the, via the scientific method is to kind of take a step back and be objective and personal um, and try to, you know, gather as many facts as neutrally as possible, right? And then another is the effort to in imitate the methods of natural science through the study of causal antecedents and origins. Scientific causality is used to explain literary phenomena by the assignment of determining causes to economic, social, and political conditions. Again, there is the introduction of the quantitative methods appropriately used in some sciences, i.e. statistics, charts, and graphs. And finally, there's the attempt to use biological concepts in the tracing of the evolution of literature. Okay, so the first kind kind of is pretty self-explanatory, right? So that's, like we said earlier, um, we're trying to, you know, collect facts as objectively and impersonally and kind of as distantly as possible. Another way we can do it is, like, in science, we look for cause and effect. So um, if we're, you know, looking about at, at how this um, does this drug lower blood pressure, we give the drug and we measure blood pressure, kind of like this. Um, we can do that similarly with with um, with literature, right? By looking at why was something written, what were what was the context, what was the cause to lead to the effect of this writing of literature. Right. Um, what were the, the the economic, social, and political conditions that led to the the literature be, 
to be written. Um, and you know, it, it's now the the author kind of gets into a few more examples of ways that we apply the scientific method again um, by summarizing the data and putting it in a logical way with charts and stats and things like that. Um, and you know, the, the rest of the examples aren't really as important. Okay. Today there would be almost general recognition that this transfer has not fulfilled the expectations with which it was made originally. Okay, so what's going on here? Today there would be almost general recognition that this transfer has not fulfilled the expectations with which it was made originally. So basically he's saying, so what is the transfer, this transfer? So this transfer was um, applying the scientific method to the study of literature. Okay. And he's saying that today, everybody kind of agrees that this really hasn't worked out the way that people expected, right? Almost general recognition of the transfer has not fulfilled expectations with which it was made originally. There is no doubt a large field in which the methodologies of science and literary study literary study contact contact or even overlap. So he's saying there are still some contexts in which you can use kind of scientific method in order to study literature. Um, but likely what we'll see is that the author will say, but in most circumstances, this is inadequate. So let's see what he says. Such fundamental methods as induction and deduction, analysis, synthesis, and comparison are common to all types of systematic knowledge. Okay, so he's saying that there are some there are some aspects of the scientific method that are shared with, you know, literary study because these are all kinds of ways of um, communicating and gathering knowledge in a systematic way. But patently, the other solution commends itself. Literary scholarship has its own valid methods, which are not always those of the natural sciences, but are nevertheless intellectual methods. So his argument is that we that literary study is distinct from the study of natural sciences. And while there are some commonalities that, you know, that include this stuff over here, um, the study of literature in and of itself is kind of its own branch and should have its own methods that are valid. Final paragraph, pay close attention because this is really what's going to help you tie things in um, because it seems like we've moved a, a lot away from what the initial paragraph was about, right? Only a very narrow conception of truth can exclude the achievements of the hum humanities from the realm of knowledge. So basically, this is a fancy way of saying um, the humanities are important. Okay. Long before modern scientific... Oops, sorry, my battery's a little low, so let's plug this in. Okay. Long before... Modern scientific development, philosophy, history, jurisprudence, jurisprudence, theology, and even philology have worked out valid methods of knowing. Their achievements may have become obscured by the theoretical and practical triumphs of the modern physical sciences, but they are nevertheless real and permanent and can, sometimes with modifications, easily be resuscitated or renovated. It should be simply recognized that there is this difference between the methods and aims of the natural sciences and the humanities. Okay. How did we get here is the real question. And I don't know if I'll be able to answer that, okay, uh, by going back. So um, just know that this is the this is the idea that the author wants to leave you with, and that this is what I will say is the main idea. So I wouldn't rely on what you see in the beginning. I would kind of see where the author takes it towards the end. That's the final thought he wants to leave you with, okay? And that is that um, the study of literature and the study of sciences have some overlapping features, right? And these are features that are fundamental and common to all types of systematic knowledge, which he agrees that literature is a form of. But he will also say that the aims and methods of natural sciences and humanities, such as literature, are different and they have their and because they are different they require their own methods and and that's okay and finally uh, that that humanities are important um, and maybe we've kind of um, focused in more recent times 
on, um, it says, their achievements may have become obscured by the theoretical and practical triumphs of modern physical sciences. So recently, you know, we've been, uh, we focused a lot on theoretical and practical triumphs of modern physical sciences. So like think about spaceships and computers and cell phones and things like that. And maybe we've strayed a little far away from the humanities, but he's trying to bring us back to there and say, hey, this is still really important. Literature and things like that are important. And this is some of the argument behind why um, in undergrad, we should still be taking humanities classes um, and that why medical schools enjoy um, students who have, you know, studied not just um, hard sciences, but have also engaged in history and literature and philosophy and things like that. Okay, so let's try to do a, a quick paragraph by paragraph summary um, and see where that will take us. So in the first paragraph, um, the, the author says that we must first make a distinction between literature and literary study, saying that, you know, there's a difference between studying literature and creating literature, saying that there are distinct activities. Um, one's creative and the other one is a science. Um, and some people have tried to, you know, make this distinction go away. Um, but it seems like he doesn't really agree with that. Um, cause he says yet useful as the experience of literary creation is the task of the student is completely different. So he's saying that the student need not engage in creating literature in order to, um, actually be able to understand it and study it, which is the, the goal of the student. Right. Um, and he's basically gives a generalized scheme of, um, how students should kind of study literature and says that they should be able to do it even if the material, the subject matter is irrational or whatever. Okay. And then he goes on to say, how do you do this? How do you study literature? Um, and he says that some people have proposed to use the scientific method and, um, he gives several different ways that the scientific is applied. The scientific method has been applied to natural sciences and, um, says in this paragraph that, you know, it's not that I don't think that he doesn't think that this is the right approach. He says he agrees. He concedes that there are some commonalities and overlapping elements between the natural sciences and the human and the humanities, but that you need to have separate methods for the two because they're distinctly different. Okay.